Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the City and County of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the July 24th, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. It is now 1.30 p.m. In this in-person live stream meeting format, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you have typed your name and it reflects your first last, and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have a technical question, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions. Reminder, during the business agenda, only TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions and members of the public may speak during public comments. Uh, as a reminder here for members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand and make sure the light is on your microphone and on when and you are prepared to speak. Please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Please announce your name and your representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. Dr. Cog is sending around a sign-in sheet, so please sign in. And if you don't catch that, please catch it by the end of the meeting. Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet. And at this time, uh, TAC members and alternates will introduce themselves. And uh, we'll start with the roll call for uh, members and alternates to introduce yourself around the room. Please name your, your name and representation. And uh, we'll start with uh, Director Micklebust. Hello, Jessica Micklebust, CDOT Region 1. Carson Priest, TDM non motorized. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Brent Soderlin, um, City of Littleton. Kevin Ash, Weld County, Frederick. Rachel Haltine, Bicycle Colorado non motorized seat. Uh, Jeff Dankenbring, representing Arapahoe County from the City of Centennial. Sarah Duesenberry, City of North Corn. Ryan Weimer, Arapahoe County. Jeff Boyd, Two Creeks Neighborhood Organization. Hi, good afternoon. Sean Poe with Commerce City. And Phil Greenwald, City of Longmont, Boulder County. Hi, everyone. Jean Sanson, City of Boulder. Hello, Frank Bruno via Mobility Services. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cox staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. John Papsdorf, Dr. Cox. Art Griffith with Douglas County. Tom Rice, Town of Kazarok. Allison, City of Aurora, Arapahoe County. Matt Williams, alternate from Douglas County, uh, City of Longtree. And Jennifer Hillhouse of the City and County of Denver. Justin Begley, City County of Denver. Bill Soroy, RTD. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Tom Moore, Rack. Lauren Curgis, Dr. Cogstaff. Josh Schwank, Dr. Cogstaff. Marissa Gahan, CDOT, Division of Transportation Development. Brody Ayers, Aviation Special Interest. And Rick Pilgrim. Great, thank you. Uh, Ron, do we have any introductions of any new members for this meeting? Not that I'm aware of, Chair. Thank you. Ron, appreciate that. So now we'll uh, open up to uh, public comment. Uh, we'll now open the meeting for public comment, and comment is limited to three minutes. And as a reminder, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we'll call on you to begin speaking. And if you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine, and we'll call on you by your last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up. As a reminder, everyone after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates may pay partake in the discussion on the agenda items. Um, do we have any public comment here in person today? Or online? Cam, do we see any raised hands? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to give it a second. 
but I don't see any hands raised online or in person. Wonderful. Thank you. We will close the public comment period, and this time we'll move on to the meeting summary. Uh, for the June 26 TAC meeting, which you'll see in your agenda packet, is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the June 26, 2023 meeting summary? Okay, seeing none, uh, the meeting summary will stand as presented. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our action item agenda. Uh, we have three items today for action. Uh, item number four, fiscal year 2024 to 2025, Unifor planning work program for the Denver region. This is attachment B in your packet. And I will hand it over to Josh Schwenk, planner. And please note the addendum in your packet. Uh, there were some correction or some additional items uh, attached there. Um, for the Unifor Work Morning Program. And um, the link provided is what will be updated. There is no errata sheet since there are no changes as a result of any um, public input. And as for public comment, no public comments were received and those were included in the addendum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as the chair mentioned, my name is Josh Schwenk. I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog, uh, presenting to you today the draft 2024 to 25 Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP. Um, so because this was last discussed in front of TAC back in uh, January, and we have several new members, um, I do want to just give a quick overview of what the UPWP is. Um, so this document essentially lists out all of the transportation planning work that Dr. Cog intends to conduct over a two-year period. Uh, so in this case, uh, federal fiscal years 2024 and 2025. Um, this is a document that helps us to share with Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration all of the work that we intend to do with the funds that they provide us in our role as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region as well as to share with all of you um, to be transparent about the work that we intend to do, as well as, of course, the public. Um, we also use it internally as a way for us to budget out staff time, resources, uh, towards all of the projects that we have upcoming. So as we develop this document, there are several things that we have to uh, keep in mind. So as a Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, there are several things that we have to do. Uh, under federal law, that includes the development of our regional transportation plan, our transportation improvement program. We have to conduct a congestion management process. Uh, we have to set uh, federal performance measures, as well as model for air quality conformity. In addition to that, uh, we have a set of federal planning factors and planning emphasis areas that must be taken into account, and I'll touch on those a little bit more in a moment. Um, and then, of course, we have our local priorities. So we have our Metro Vision Plan, our Regional Transportation Plan that kind of steer where we want to go as a region. And, of course, input from all of you all. Um, back in January and February, we uh, had some outreach with TAC, with RTC, and with the board to get their input on what some of their priorities were for us to take on over the coming two years. So there's a lot on this slide. I won't go through each of these, but these are the 10 uh, planning factors. Uh, these are set in federal regulations by Congress. So when the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, our most recent transportation authorization bill was passed, it included these. Uh, these must be taken into account by every MPO in the country. So these inform uh, how we develop this document as well as the planning emphasis areas. These are released by FHWA and FTA. Uh, they represent more of uh, some of the current priorities of the administration. So these must be taken into account by us as well as we develop our UPWP. So I'll go over what's in the current draft document. Um, very simple structure. It opens with an executive summary and intro. It covers a lot of that context that I just went over for all of you. Uh, the main meat of the document is the planning activities section. Uh, that includes nine objectives, which are kind of broad topic areas. Within those, within each objective, there's several activities, which are kind of specific uh, topic areas that we want to address. And then within each activity, there's a bullet point list of tasks that we intend to conduct within the two-year time period, as well as deliverables, so specific products that we want to produce. 
and then several appendices at the end. So just to run through those kind of nine broad objectives, and for those of you that have been paying attention in the past, we've had seven objectives for many years in the past. Uh, we have expanded that to nine, just to take into account some of the expanded work that we are uh, taking part in. So objective one, uh, this is really uh, staff training management and compliance with all of our federal and state requirements. Objective two is really outreach and engagement, uh, both with the public and with all of our partners in the region. Objective three is primarily uh, focused on our Metro Vision plan, as well as all of our land use, housing, growth and development planning. Objective four is where our regional transportation plan sits, as well as our various modal plans, uh, freight, active transportation, et cetera. Objective five uh, is air quality planning, so really looking at air quality conformity as well as some of our climate pollution reduction grant activities. Objective six is uh, the transportation improvement program and its set-aside programs. Objective seven is looking at operations and system management as well as safety planning and innovative mobility. Objective eight is looking at public transit. And then objective nine is looking at all the modeling and data that inform um, really all the work that we do in the other objectives. So just a few highlights. Um, there's a lot in this document. Uh, we're going to be very busy over the coming years. Uh, we're looking at amending or passing updates to several of our existing plans, including our, non, our suite of non-discrimination plans, our public engagement plan, as well as our active transportation, freight, and regional vision zero plans. We're looking at developing some new documents. So of course, we have to develop the next UPWP during the time period of this one. Uh, some climate action plans associated with the climate pollution reduction grant, um, our new TDM strategic plan, and our two-year update to the TIP. Um, beginning some planning activities for some major updates to MetroVision, the Regional Transportation Plan, and that four-year update to the TIP that includes the calls for projects, and then several um, kind of implementation programs, uh, so some assistance to local municipalities around some of the activities identified in our Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan, all of our Housing and Transportation Coordination Planning, our new TIP set-asides focused on corridor planning, community-based planning, small area planning, and innovative mobility, and then our new regional BRT program. And these are just a few highlights of what's in the document. So with that overview, um, I do have a proposed motion available for you, but I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair, in case uh, TAC has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Uh, are there any questions or comments for Mr. Schwenk or Dr. Cox staff? Seeing none, motion. Mr. Pilgrim. Not sure your mic was on, but uh, for the record that Mr. Pilgrim made the motion as recommended. I'll second. Second by Mr. Soroy. Any discussion? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Uh, the next agenda uh, item in our packet is the fiscal year. Uh, 2024 to 2025 Transportation Demand Management, or also known as TDM, Transportation Improvement Program Set Aside Funding Recommendations. This is attachment C in your packet. Now I'll pass it off to uh, Nisha Mokashagandam, Way to Go Manager for Communications and Marketing. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Nisha Mokashagandam. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Way to Go Manager. And today I'm going to be sharing recommendations for funding through the TDM Services Set Aside Grant for fiscal years 2024 and 25. Um, and these project proposals were submitted by sponsors, also reviewed and scored in June. 
So before we start, I wanted to share a little bit about the purpose of the set-aside grants. Um, the purpose of the grants is to fund local projects that reduce single occupant vehicle travel, and these projects should also reduce traffic congestion, improve air quality, and overall support better connectivity through the region. So for the current round of set-asides, the committee had about had $1 million to allocate to project sponsors, and using data-driven scoring, the review panel assessed each submission and scored each project based on elements, uh, including their potential to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled through regional roads, and projects were then ranked in order based on the scores that they received. So the review panel consisted of seven members from both Dr. Cog as well as some outside agencies, including CDOT, CDPHE, RAC, and RTD. And the panel reviewed project submissions individually. Um, then we met to discuss project scores. And based on the scores, these projects were ranked in order of which project scored the highest. So wanted to share a little bit about the project timeline. Um, so we kicked off uh, the, the project application process back in April, and we first invited prospective applicants to attend a mandatory workshop where they learned about TDM set-asides and uh, what steps would be necessary for them to qualify and be eligible. Um, each uh, project applicant was required to submit a letter of intent, and uh, that was due at the end of April. Any applicant who submitted a letter of intent was then invited to um, apply for the TDM set aside, or rather submit an application for the TDM set aside, and those were due at the beginning of June. So all of these dates um, you can see on the slide. So I wanted to let everybody know that Dr. Cog received 12 applications, and panel members then, as I mentioned, reviewed and scored each project, and that ultimately led us to a ranked list of projects. So in the next two slides, I'm going to walk you through which projects the panel recommends for funding. And um, just as a reminder to all of you, all of these project descriptions are also available in your packet if you'd like to follow along. So as I mentioned in a previous slide, Dr. Cog did receive 12 applications for funding. Um, and uh, the panel recommends that six of those projects be funded, with a seventh to be placed on a wait list. Um, so I will just talk through each of these projects. Um, I've got three projects listed per slide, so we'll have two slides here before I share descriptions of all six of those. Um, so the first project I wanted to talk about was submitted by Denver Streets Partnership, and this was um, to explore the development of a mobility benefits district along East Colfax. So a little bit more on the goals of the project. Um, the goal is really to address on and off street parking uh, demand. And the program would also propose exploring additional opportunities to educate travelers and residents in that area, um, of which non-single occupant vehicle mobility options are available to them, including BRT. The second project that the panel recommended for funding is an expansion of the Viva Streets um, program hosted by Downtown Denver Partnership. Um, and this program is a summer event that, through street closures, demonstrates the connectivity between various downtown Denver neighborhoods. Um, and these are really geared toward people who are either biking or traveling by foot. And this expansion for funding would allow the project sponsor, Downtown Denver Partnership, to better target members of the BIPOC community. And the third proposed project on this page um, comes from West Corridor. This project would provide awareness and education to Sun Valley residents and is really um, meant to address the growing population in that area. Uh, West Corridor would use the funds to highlight which sustainable transportation options are uh, available to residents and people who are traveling through the area. Um, they propose developing marketing materials that would be translated and made culturally relevant to speakers of Vietnamese and Spanish. So here are the, the final three projects that are recommended. Um, this next one is Smart Commute's pro proposed project called Using Data to Optimize Flex Ride Services. Um, and working with RTD on data capture, Smart Commute proposes studying the feasibility of launching a Flex Ride service um, and determining what routes and service needs would be most beneficial to commuters. 
Um, Smart Commute will primarily focus on understanding where the workforce resides, what challenges they're currently experiencing in their commutes, and um, other information related to their route. The panel also recommended for funding a project proposed by Boulder Chamber, Boulder Transportation Connections. Um, using the set-aside funding, the sponsor proposes developing a marketing campaign that would inform commuters of a proposed flex shuttle service in Gun Barrel. And the proposed shuttle will serve about 12,000 commuters who lost service as a result of RTD service cuts. Stakeholders including RTD, City of Boulder, and County of Boulder, or I'm sorry, Boulder County, have spent the last three years working with the project sponsor on developing a plan and a framework for this project. And then the sixth recommended project for funding comes from Northeast Transportation Connections, and this seeks to explore the feasibility and the resource needed to launch and also sustain a microtransit community center that would serve the southwest corridor of Commerce City. And to achieve this task, the sponsors propose evaluating route options again, marketing to residents and travelers, and developing a blueprint for a free service similar to the GES and Montbello connectors that are now managed by the Denver Connector Program. So that concludes uh, the recommendations of the panel. I'm happy to take any questions you might have, and here is our proposed motion. Thank you, Ms. Mocha Shukanandam. Do we have any questions for Dr. Cog's staff? Mr. Weimer. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you talk about what you are recommending. I see that you have five projects that you didn't recommend. Can you go into the reasons why? Uh, so simply, the project uh, panel did not feel that those projects were strong enough to fund. And so, um, as I mentioned, each project was ranked based on scoring. We really looked down the line of projects based on the order in which they were scored, and we figured which could be funded given the amount of money that we had. Mr. Pilgrim? Um, Erickson. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, excellent question. I'm Steve Erickson, uh, Communications and Marketing Director at Dr. Cog and oversee the Way to Go program and, and this TDM set aside. And Brian, one of the things, um, you know, simply that we looked at and that the panel uh, discussed was, uh, you know, the, the scoring in, in uh, different, um, with different criteria. VMT reduction is king. Uh, none of those projects below the line were expected really to, to reduce much um, uh, vehicle miles traveled. I think that would have been the biggest factor. Um, and perhaps second, maybe I, I heard discussion about, um, you know, maybe not being as innovative as, as some of the projects that were selected. So I think those are probably the two primary though. Mr. Pilgrim. Uh, so Nisha and Steve, two questions. One, one to follow up on Brian. Um, <clears throat> is, is there an opportunity for them in the future? Will this come through another cycle next year or the year after? Yeah, we're thinking most likely, thank you, he's taller than me, uh, most likely in the, the next round of funding will happen uh, again in April 2025. Okay. Um, and then, so, and, and these programs might be able to, to put more together and then come back with a better rationale. And so you give them feedback. Um, and then secondly, uh, it, the funding amounts, are those enough for the total program or is that matched with some other contribution? So each project sponsor is required to provide a local match of 17.21%. Um, most of the sponsors have matched that number. They're also welcome to match at a higher rate. So that would be sort of the that Dr. Cog funded versus the matched amount. Okay, thank you. Mr. Weimer? I'll make a recommendation. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Project awards through FY 2024 through 2025 TDM services tip set aside program and that the seven <clears throat> ranked projects be placed on or the seventh ranked project be ranked placed on the waiting list. Thank you, 
you, Mr. Weimer. Mr. Greenwald? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And any abstentions? Oh, Mr. Priest? I will abstain from the vote. Thank you. For the record, Mr. Priest will abstain from the vote. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item number six, fiscal year 2024 to 2027, Transportation Improvement Program, also known as the TIF. Attachment D in your packet. Um, this will be presented by Todd Cottrell, Project and Program Delivery Manager. Please note in your addendum that there are three items, uh, agenda item six attachments for the 2024 to 2027 TIP. Public comment draft linked in the memo is to be replaced with the link that was provided. The errata sheet outlining changes also uh, is included as a link and the public comment summary is included as a link. And this is also available at the drcog.org slash calendar. Um, invitation for the Dr. Cog TAC meeting today. Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. So it's been two and a half years. Um, we are nearing completion. I hope every everyone sort of is getting what they would like, and we're going to uh, ultimately look for your recommendation um, this afternoon on these three documents. So the 24 to 27 Transportation Improvement Program, the Ozone Conformity Determination, and the state greenhouse gas transportation report. The TIP itself is not created in a vacuum. It's built on other documents, such as the regional transportation plan and the transportation outcomes of Metro Vision. It's a way for Dr. Cog to look and see what that vision is for the region and ultimately um, place those with actual funding to build and construct those types of projects. The TIP is the short short-term four-year planning program, and it's going to outline specific dollars with years attached to each one of those individual projects. So Dr. Cog creates one of these new uh, documents through the program every two years. Um, and as Josh had, Josh had indicated in his presentation, we do hold the major calls for projects every four. Typically every four, I think this cycle was a little bit unique, and we sort of had to have four calls for projects, which we'll get into here in a second. But the program itself is going to contain not only those projects that were selected by Dr. Cog, it's also going to contain any projects with federal and state transportation funds, including CDOT, RTD, and even local agencies if they do have regionally significant projects with local funds. So Dr. Cog has allocation authority over five funding types, uh, four of them federal, one of them state. And this is not just a program that we complete every two years, stick on the shelf, it is amended almost on a monthly basis. The program has what we would, saw, what we would call three major elements. Uh, the first being the funding allocation process, um, including the set-asides in both the regional and sub-regional share. Uh, the graphic on the right sort of outlines what that process is. The second major element would be the sub-regional forums. So it's a way for for Dr. Cog to achieve that regional vision across the entire, um, across all eight um, forums, but also a way for each one of those individual forums to inject any local values they have if they wish. And the third itself is the document which is going for recommendation here this afternoon. The individual calls for projects for this tip, as I mentioned, um, a little bit unusual. Four calls for projects lasting approximately a year and a half. Um, and what we don't see on the screen here is the year leading up to that for the TIP policy development. Um, so it's been almost two and a half years of, of work to create this actual document. Um, a lot more than usual, let's put it that way. But we did cover five individual funding sources through those four calls, um, covering six years all the way from last year through uh, 2027 and two TIP documents. So we went through that process with calls one and two to program um, those additional projects to the current 22 to 25 TIP. Each one of those calls were a little bit different and specific in terms of years, funding available, match rates, et cetera. And so when we sort of look at calls one and two, 
we're out there to program the current 22 to 25 tip. And these last two calls were to program this draft tip. It's a little difficult to discern exactly how things were lining up. So I think the best way, at least on a staff perspective, is that to take all four calls and look at them, look at them like this is what was selected for this time period. Slight, again, slightly different than what we've done in the past. Um, for example, there might be an individual applicant who only applied in calls one and two or maybe one and three where that wouldn't necessarily tell the entire picture of what that applicant was trying to do. So again, just something to keep in mind versus what we would say a normal tip cycle. Overall, almost a half billion dollars in Dr. Cog funds are included with this tip. Overall investment, over $2 billion, including all of the CDOT, RTD, and other local projects. Federal air quality conformity is necessary for this reason region based on our non-attainment status. Um, and so therefore this tip and all tips must reduce those pollutants. And keeping in mind, when we look at those regionally significant projects contained within this document in this program, it's regional. Therefore, we're not looking at an one individual project, we're modeling them and getting the results out of a collection of projects. Uh, also, a couple of years ago, there was a new state requirement um, for the new TIPS and in fact, even new RTPs to achieve that greenhouse gas emission reduction target. And since the TIP is essentially based on the TIP, therefore all of those regionally significant projects that happen to be in this TIP are also federally required to be in the regional transportation plan. And within the regional transportation plan, all of those um, projects did pass the pollutant tests and the planning rule for GHG. We can therefore conclude that this TIP also passed um, the emissions test for the regional air quality conformity and for the greenhouse gas planning rule. So when we look at this TIP document, what do we think we're going to accomplish? Well, if we simply look at by funding, 62% of the funding available through Dr. Cog will go towards active transportation, 23% for transit, and 14% to road, roadway projects. 190 intersections will be improved, 95 miles of bike ped facilities will be built. Um, looking ahead to the future, 34 studies will be prepared and completed. 70% of those projects will implement complete street elements. 80% of those projects will improve those connections to transit. 65% um, will be in or near an urban center. And again, on the high injury network, um, there's projected that 51 fewer, fewer fatal crashes over the next five years will occur and 302 fewer serious injury crashes will occur. So the proposed motion before you is on the screen. And um, before we go to any questions or comments on a personal note, I certainly would like to thank everyone in this room who are involved in those TIP calls. Um, I do know that it was a very long process, um, but I do thank you for being involved and, and helping us grow as a region. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Any questions or comments? Mr. Reef. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, that pie chart you were showing up there with the percentage gap between them, how was that calculated? So for each individual application, we broke down what, was, what are the costs within the application. So if we took a roadway operational project and it did have an active transportation component, we would separate those. Okay, so, so some of these bigger roadway projects would out going to and sidewalk elements within that larger project. Correct. This is not as noted by each individual project type, but when we look at that $495 million, this would be the breakdown of where those sources of funding are going towards and what they will improve. Great. I, I appreciate that. I'm seeing no further questions or comments. And oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead, Mr. That's okay. Mr. Um, just a, a quick question. And Todd, I don't know that this is specifically for you because I know it's part of a bigger conversation. But the GHG letter is part of this. 
um, is just a reflection of the tip itself, correct? There's a whole other ongoing maintenance and monitoring of the GHG rule that happens separate. The tip is a piece of that. Is that correct? I know that's more of a Jacob. Maybe I'll let Ryan ch Ron chime in. Um, I understand the question <clears throat> correctly. Under the state's greenhouse gas rule, um, the uh, planning documents that are subject to the rule include um, adoptions or amendments to regional transportation plans and adoptions of new transportation improvement program. Yes. So the four-year TIP. Amendments to the TIP are not subject to the rule. Um, the, the provisions of our agreement between Dr. Cog, CDOT, and the um, of Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment includes a provision relative to TIPs that we can rely on previous analysis to determine um, our compliance with the rule requirements and the target reductions. Because as Todd explained, TIPs only implement a regional transportation plan. We can't put regionally significant projects in a TIP if they're not already in the, in the plan. And since we just adopted a new plan last fall, that through our analysis demonstrated compliance with the rules target reductions uh, for greenhouse gas emissions over the life of the plan. A TIP itself, which implements a portion, a sliver of time of the RTP, really there is no new analysis to do. It, it incorporates the RTP um, through the project investments to the TIP. So the determination is that we have complied with those rule requirements. The Transportation Commission at their meeting last week adopted a resolution accepting the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report and the analysis as part of this TIP. As you'll recall, many of you, when we adopted the Regional Transportation Plan and part of our compliance and the way we um, accomplished the reduction targets from the rule was the inclusion of a mitigation action plan that was additional sort of regional land use, mostly land use sort of related measures that we collectively would implement over the course of the, over the lifetime of the plan to help fill that final gap in the greenhouse gas reduction measures. And every year we have to report back to CDOT and the commission on our progress on that, on that mitigation action plan at this last April. Did I? Yes, I, you answered my question and more. I think the um, tip adoption and the, green, and the air quality modeling is the standard part of every time a TIP happens. This is in addition, correct? I mean, this is somewhat new, different than... It's actually, well, the greenhouse gas rule is new for this TIP, but we have for a long time had to do the federal air quality conformity determination for TIPs as well, similar to what we have to do with the rule. There is no new modeling, there is no new analysis associated with the TIP because there's no new analysis to do. We did all of that, we did all of that analysis, all that modeling as part of the regional, the last regional transportation plan adoption. So I, I guess maybe that's answering your question. There is no new analysis. We, we use the analysis that was done for the most recent regional transportation plan. Ms. Holtine. Thanks. Um, so remind me of the time frame when the next TIP calls for projects would be opening. We just covered it a couple of presentations ago. So the next calls will be summer to fall of 26. Okay. And that will cover 28 to 31. And so Am I remembering correctly that we actually have a compliance of 2025 emissions for the greenhouse? Is that correct? Cool. I believe so. I'm not the expert. I'll let Ron. Rachel, the the tar the horizon years or the target years in the rule are 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. So. How would the, maybe this is slightly off topic, but to Justin's questions, how would the next tip be affected if we're not meeting our targets in 20? Well, on, we will have, we will have um, likely a, a new or amended regional transportation plan by then. And really the regional transportation plan is the way that we do the analysis and the modeling and estimating, and, and it's estimating. Um, based on, on model analysis of the greenhouse gas emissions. 
what we what we had to do for this tip because the rule requires us to demonstrate compliance at the last year of the tip and the last year of the tip does not align with one of the horizon years that's in the rule we had to interpolate between 2025 and 2030 to sort of figure out what the what the um, values would be that we had to had to achieve and we interpolated between the results the model results for the for the RTP okay, great thanks for explaining Other questions or comments? Uh, any, is there a motion? I'll move. Oh. It's DeAndrea. Thank you. Yes, I'll move to recommend to the RT Regional Transportation Committee the fiscal year 2024 to 2027. Transportation Improvement Program and the Associated Air Quality Documents and Green Transportation Report. Mr. Griffith? Uh, second the motion. Mr. Griffith, uh, any further discussion? Okay, well, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Great, the motion passes. Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody and all the subregions and all the agencies around this table for this tip cycle. Much appreciated. Um, we will move on now. That was our final action item uh, agenda for today. Our next uh, agenda item is an informational briefing um, on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Overview. This is attachment E in your packet, and I'll hand it over to Ron Papsdorf to introduce this topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to introduce Chrissy Bright, who is the Front Range Passenger Rail District Program Manager. I appreciate her joining us this afternoon. Um, many of you may recall that the, the Front Range Passenger Rail District was created by Senate Bill 238 to replace the previous Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission that existed. Think I got a thumbs up from Chrissy. Wow, that's great. Um, and we just thought, given the work that the district is now doing and has been doing for, gosh, almost a couple of years now, I uh, wanted to invite them to give an update to the TAC on their current and upcoming activities as it relates to Front Range Passenger Rail development in the Front Range Corridor. Chrissy, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's like finding the right distance. Um, so I just first want to welcome you all and thank you all. Um, Andy Carsey, our general manager, could not be here today. He's at uh, State Capitol for TLRC and sends his regrets that he's not here. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that many of you have been part of this conversation for a long time now. So I apologize, some of these slides seem kind of introductory, but I'm happy to take questions after I get through them. Um, I think essentially in alignment with your last presentation, um, you know, we all know the challenges regarding congestion, safety, reliability, greenhouse gas emissions, and our disconnected communities. And that's kind of the issues that we think of. We look to why we need to have a new transportation option. This mic is weird. I might just project. Um, so what is Front Range Passenger Rail? It is a new inner city train service, and you'll keep hearing me say inner city. Um, the initial service will be from Pueblo through Denver, a long way to Fort Collins um, with stops along the way. There's a long-term vision of connecting to New Mexico and Wyoming. Um, and the key kind of differentiator for our transportation project right now is using freight railroads to minimize costs and accelerate the start date. So using the freight network for the um, initial service. Part of our role in public outreach and outreach to stakeholders is kind of demystifying inner city rail versus commuter rail. And so as we kind of go through our outreach, you'll more and more kind of see us using the word inner city rail. Um, and then it's also kind of a level setting. And so inner city connects major cities across the state, unlike our more traditional, we know more of commuter rail, it's kind of connecting areas in a metropolitan area. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of show that as part of that inner city rail conversation, it's really not just about commuters getting to their jobs. It's a much broader universe of people that can use the train. And so part of our goal is to kind of communicate that many voices and many people that can use it. Um, every time I talk to folks, it's new people that they, and new ideas of who could be using it, whether it be veterans reaching healthcare in different cities, um, families that can no longer afford to live where they work and matters like that. So. Just some, just some of the initial people I've heard from so far. Oh, this one. 
Um, and then again, as was you know said well in the introduction, this is this is not a new conversation. Um, you know, I, it's funny to kind of look back and say when was the the introductory point to this conversation, but. Um, you know, at least around 2010, there was the, uh, the interregional connectivity study, the high-speed rail feasibility study. Um, in 2014, we had the initial Southwest Chief Commission that worked to um, kind of save the chief from being rerouted outside of Colorado. That then led to the 2017 um, Southwest Chief and Parkway Passenger Rail Commission, kind of the initial CDOT sort of led group that was looking at how to build this train service. Um, many of you are probably involved in the alternatives evaluation in 2020. Um, since then, we have gotten a grant, a Christie grant from the FRA to do a service development plan. And then most excitedly for me, the district was established. Um, so then what is the Front Range Passenger Rail District? We are a new state government created in 2021. Um, we had our first board meeting in about a year ago. So we're essentially a year, a year um, in, act in action. And we are really tasked with, from the state legislature, to plan, finance, design, construct, and operate the passenger rail service. Um, many folks think of us because we will inevitably need taxpayer funding to make this happen. So we are also a taxing district. Um, in addition to that, we are working with local communities to develop the rail stations. And as you can tell from the map on the right, our border is a state-to-state -state border, um, and the blue is the district boundary. And you'll notice how it kind of um, cleaves outwards to, to kind of uh, sort of, you know, essentially collect more of the population along the front range, but that would be the area of the taxing district. Um, we have a very diverse board of directors. And so as part of our board of directors, we have four Dr. Cobb representatives. The other MPOs in the area are also on our board, as well as governor appointments and some non-voting members. Um, I think just the big thing to mention is that this is kind of the, the once in a lifetime moment um, with all of the planning to date, with the IAJA programs and things like that, this is kind of our, our moment to make this happen. Um, so along those lines, the district has applied for the quarter identification development program. It's an FRA program that essentially was brand new, created to help bring new passenger rail programs online. So it's helping states like Colorado that don't have the service already to develop um, inner city passenger rail. So we applied in March and will hopefully be accepted in the fall. And then after that acceptance, we initially received $500,000 and are eligible for um, millions of dollars in federal grants. Right now, we're working on the service development plan. Um, essentially, it is the business plan that kind of lays the case to FRA that makes this, this is a feasible service. And you know, we, we believe in it, and you also should invest in us. So it looks at things like station location, service frequency, the infrastructure improvements we need to do, things like that. This started in late 2022, and it will conclude the end of next year. Um, and again, it's looking at that Pueblo to Fort Collins segment for our initial service, while also recognizing that our district boundaries are border to border. Um, this slide is a little busying, but the reason I share it is just to show that um, we've done a lot of work. We also have a lot of work ahead of us, and I think just for kind of expectation setting, um, we still have NEPA ahead of us. So <laughs> more, more planning to come, um, and please know we'll be finding you in the future for additional planning work. Um, so what does it take to pull this off other than massive amounts of federal funding and, and taxpayer support? It's partnerships. So from you know, getting support at the ballot to developing stations and station improvement districts to having multimodal connectivity, and actually impl implementing it, it's a, ver a variety of stakeholders that we're going to be calling upon to help advance this and make this actually happen. Again, it's kind of a complex picture. And so in our minds, the district, we see it as a kind of four-year plan leading into the ballot. Of course, now it's 2023, so it's really a three-year plan. But this just kind of breaks down what we're working at each year and kind of how we progressively get more kind of detailed and refined in our work to get us to probably a voter ask in 2026. So that is what I have for you today. I forgot to start my timer. so I have no idea how long I went, but I'm happy to take questions if there's still time. Otherwise, you're welcome to send Andy or myself an email. Thank you, Ms. Bright. Yeah. Any questions or comments for Front Range Passenger Rail? Mr. Griffith. Yeah, thanks. Um, when you say the initial would be from like I think you said Fort Collins to Pueblo. Mm -hmm. Would that preclude you from starting a segment sooner from like Fort Collins to Denver? Um, I mean, I, I don't 
know if you're limiting yourself because maybe a certain segment is completed or to elaborate on that. Yeah, that's the million dollar question we've been having lately is how best do you phase it? How best do you phase it in terms of getting general public and stakeholder support? What makes sense from a financial perspective? Um, so I think there's a lot of possibilities that we're still working through. None of it's been defined yet. Mr. Papstorf. Thanks again for being here, Chrissy. Yeah. So I, I noticed on the four-year plan leading to the ballot initiative, there's a um, statement in 2025 for Northwest Rail, local government outreach, and NEPA. Mm -hmm. um, has there been an alignment determination made for Front Range Passenger Rail that it will follow the Northwest Rail Corridor, or if not, um, are we predetermining outcome, or what is the process for the, for the alignment portion and the alignment determination for the corridor? That's a great question. Um, it's a quirky process that the FRA has us do a service development plan based upon an alignment before NEPA. So everything we do is is our, our best intention and kind of our planning, but it's all subject to NEPA. So to your point, uh, and again, kind of the the, uh, the setting of expectations, we kind of have to open up, up again during NEPA. Um, the legislation that created the district sort of says that the preference is to use Northwest Rail alignment. And so there are a few kind of indicators pointing towards that is the way we're going. Right now, the route analysis is being finalized and we sent to FRA, I think, later this month. And so it's still somewhat open, but um, kind of a lot of the signs point towards Northwest Rail being the alignment that'll be used, again, all subject to NEPA. And, and just to be clear, yeah. I, I, I'm not expressing any Dr. Cog or any personal yeah. preference for an alignment one way or the other, because I know there are lots of advocates for Northwest Rail being a corridor, and there's probably a lot of advantages to that, but I also know there are other alignment options available. So I just want to be clear about what process the district is going through to analyze the various alternative uh, routing options. Yeah, absolutely. So a big part of it is the federal grant we received names the major markets we're connecting, so our purpose and needs speaks to that. And the major markets that it names is, oh boy, Pueblo, Castle Rock, Pueblo, Colorado Springs, Castle Rock, Denver, Boulder, Longmont, Loveland, Fort Collins. So that kind of puts some, some you know, shape around it there. Additionally, we are only looking at freight infrastructure, so that also limits what our opportunities are for this first service. Mr. Moore. Thank you, very interesting presentation. Can you talk a little bit of how you would qualify and select uh, an operator? Yes, um, so our district board is starting to kind of unpack that right now. Um, I think it's a triangulation of factors. Um, obviously, one of the biggest ones is that we're operating on host railroad infrastructure. So we have to figure out an operator plan that works well for what their needs are, continuing their, you know, their business of moving freight. Um, additionally, it's you know clearly a matter of who's interested in doing the service, who has the required insurance and track record to actually deliver the service. And so, as part of that process, I think it's you know it's an ongoing conversation of getting an initial sense of who's out there, who's interested, who has capabilities, and then as we move further and further through the actual development of the project, through you know 30% design and engineering of that nature, it kind of becomes more of a solidified thing. But um, I think the way I look at it now is kind of early conversations with potential operators and with the host railroads to get a sense of sort of what are some of the common understandings and opportunities that are arising. Yeah. Mr. Weimer. Well, this might be a bit premature, but I'm going to ask the question. Maybe Perfect. you've had some discussion. Yeah. And that is, I see you have a financing plan for 2024. Have you had a discussion as to what might go on a ballot or what are you considering giving today's economic conditions? That's a great question. Um, it's a fabulous question. And it's not a premature one. I think our plan right now is a lot of aspirational goals we're kind of thinking through and ideating on. So we don't have any sort of sense yet of what would really be on the ballot from a funding perspective. Um, I think the expectation is a sales tax. Um, our, state, our state statute does let us also levy property taxes, but I think we recognize with the recent increase, that's really a not very palatable one for voters. So um, 
being developed as we speak. I know our board is trying to look at this from kind of an equity lens and trying to understand what is um, possible and, and legal. But, you know, the idea of sort of if you get service, you know, later than others, can you have kind of a graduated tax or a later to be developed tax and trying to understand what opportunities exist to try to make the funding more of an equitable um, consideration. But more to come, a lot more to come. Mr. Griffith? Um, when you look at those um, funding opportunities, property tax, sales tax, will all that be part of the NEPA process or will you have already screened out those before you weigh in? And, I, and it's kind of like you're at the ballot thing going at the same time, so you almost have to do them simultaneously. That's a good question I haven't received yet. I personally haven't thought of NEPA and the taxing being in the same conversation, which maybe speaks to my own ignorance, but they will definitely be parallel conversations. And to your point, um, yeah, I think we all are hopeful for a, a more expedient NEPA, but we also recognize that NEPA is never, never expedient, never easy. And so um, our goal is to start that in early 2025. If we go to the voters in fall 2026, the timing is interesting. But um, those would be developed, I think, as parallel conversations that feed into one another. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Great, for bringing this presentation to us and for the work that Front Range Passenger Rail is doing right now for the service, de service development plan, communications, and partner coordination, and looking forward to hearing uh, the results from the corridor identification program. Thank you so much, Ms. Grant. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to our informational item, which is item number eight in your packet. And this is the PROTECT grant update, um, and I'll hand it over to Ron Papsdorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just real quick, because we did just include this for information purposes, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I, hopefully, you're kind of getting the routine now. We, I know hopefully you're finding it helpful and informative. We do ask for many of the federal discretionary grant programs for prospective applicants to just share some basic information about the projects they might be considering uh, for submittal to the federal government for those discretionary grant programs. I think it helps the entire region kind of identify perhaps opportunities to coordinate that may Maybe weren't there, but just awareness of what other jurisdictions around the region are pursuing for these major grant opportunities, um, because they're they're coming at us fast and furious. And I think it's important for all of us to be aware of uh, what's going on, and especially because many of local government and other agency sponsors of these grant applications often allow, uh, often ask Dr. Cog to supply support letters. And I, I feel like it's important from a transparency standpoint that everyone in the region be aware of what we're being asked to support in terms of local applications. Um, so this most recent one is the PROTECT grant. It's a resiliency grant. It's really about hardening and planning uh, for infrastructure improvements around the country to make them uh, make them uh, better able to withstand or deal with impacts from particularly climate change, but other environmental um, disasters and, and impacts as well. Uh, there's four, categ four funding categories this round under the PROTECT grant uh, that were covered in the note. Uh, we had asked we had asked for submittals uh, to us of this basic information by August 18th. We received 13 submittals from six agencies. Those are included in your in the um, agenda packet. We did receive two after the deadline I'm not, uh, um, from Denver and Aurora. Thank you for getting them to us anyways, even though they were a couple days late. That's fine. Uh, we, the timing for this round was a little off because uh, the, the applications aren't actually due until August 18th, but because of the timing of our July TAC meeting and the August TAC meeting, this is a little bit, it, it was by, granted a little bit earlier than I think we normally sort of are able to sort of ask for these forms a little closer to the deadline to give people a little bit more time. So no big deal. 
we're all good. Um, so unless if, if you have questions about particular uh, projects, uh, I think uh, I'm not in a position to answer those questions, but you can raise them here if there are representatives from those. There's also contact, there's also the uh, uh, contact at the agencies if you uh, have a need to or desire to reach out to any of the agencies submitted forms directly, you're welcome to do that as well. If any of uh, any of the local sponsors for any of these applications is here, if you're looking for a Dr. Cog support letter, please contact me. Um, I'll, I'll be coordinating those efforts to get those um, to you so you can get those in your application packet by the deadline. I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Pilgrim? Uh, Ron, does, well, I was impressed by Deer Trails submittals, uh, you add them together, it's almost $16 million. And for a small, small community like that, is a part of some of the grants are they're set aside for rural areas. Does Deer Trail qualify as a rural area if we're in the MPO? I muted myself instead of unmuting myself. Um, Yes. So under most of the discretionary grant programs, the, de the, the federal definition of rural, even if a community is in an, a metropolitan planning organization boundary, it's if the community is located outside of an urbanized, an urbanized area, a UZA, that's it, a population greater than 200,000. So our, our large UZA is the Denver Lakewood Aurora urbanized area, which does not encompass the entire MPO boundary. So any jurisdiction outside of that UZA boundary is for these purposes classified as rural. Would include deer. Okay, uh, so I wish them the best of luck. Uh, do, do you report the results when, you know, will you say after the awards are made? Uh, I just would like, to, I'm curious, I'd like to follow them. Thanks Rick, that's a really good point. We have not, um, typically sort of reported out to this group uh, successful grant applications as a rule. I think we can do that. We, we generally get notification as well. And I think the most recent ones were the raised grants. Probably should include that in the next agenda packet, sort of the, the last couple of recent um, award cycles and what projects in the region were awarded funds. And Pam will help me remember to do that for the protect grants. <laughs> And just as a clarification, your trail is not within the MPO. The MPO goes to Kiowa Creek. So they're further east by a long ways. So just as an FYI, I, I have sort of the New Yorker's view of eastern Colorado. I, I, I'm not sure what's out there. <laughs> Neither am I. So. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? I really appreciate Dr. Cog bringing these opportunities uh, forward to us. There's a lot of funding coming from the uh, federal agencies and providing the transparency of the other projects that are coming forward and looking forward to hearing the reports out on successful projects. Um, next item is uh, member comments and other matters. Uh, Carson, do we have an advanced mobility program working group update? Uh, I do not this month, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Priest. Uh, any other updates or reminders from Dr. Cog, Mr. Papstorf? Cool. Um, any other comments from any member of the TAC? Okay, well, thank you everybody for another successful TAC meeting. Our next meeting will be August 28th, 2023. Um, if you did not sign in, please make sure you, you check in at the back table. There should be the sign-in sheet or come find uh, Mr. Kennedy to be sure you are registered as attending. Thank you for your participation, participation today, and uh, we are now adjourned at 2.34 p.m. Thank you.